interview. Okay, so um, I just need to do like a little intro and then we can start with the questions. So this is Samika Rosado with the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program. Today is April 14th, 2020, and it is 2.29 p.m. And I'm here with Steve Wolfeder. I don't, I'm really bad at names. How do you Yulfeder. say your last name? Yulfeder, right. Um, it's so nice to meet you, Steve. Steven. Um, nice to meet you. Um, so what we'll do first is usually I ask a little background about you, and then we go into more like UF-related things. Okay. So to start off, Hmm? Go ahead. Okay, okay. So to start off, I just wanted to know um, where you were born, the year that you were born, uh, where you grew up, stuff like that. Okay, I was born uh, May 20, 1946 in West Palm Beach, Florida. My dad uh, was an immigrant from Germany where his grandparents had been killed in a concentration camp. And he met my mother and they moved to West Palm Beach. And I grew up there and went to high, elementary, middle, and high school there. And then I went on to the University of Florida. Okay. Um, was there any um, motivating factors for you to go to UF? No, I just had heard great things about it. And I thought it was a good place to go. And it was affordable. And it was a good opportunity. Okay. Um, wait, let me check. Okay. So it's still recording. Um, so you went to UF because of these reasons and you were also involved in student government, you said? At the University of Florida I was. Yes. Yeah, at the University of Florida. I was president of the student body in 1970-71. Right, from 1970-71. Um, I had seen um, that in 71, there was this kind of um, sit-in uh, at O'Connell's office and that the um, there were a lot of thoughts surrounding what had happened that day on Black Thursday. I wanted to know if you had any kind of like opinions on the subject or your mindset at the time, given that there was not a lot of um, information on that. Sure. Yeah, I remember the day quite well. It was towards the end of my term as president of the student body. And uh, I had a very close relationship with the Black Student Union and the African-American students on campus. And I had fought hard for increasing minority representation, both at the student level and at the faculty level, because I thought we had a very small number of African-American students and faculty, and I thought it should increase. Uh, I, I, I understood the students' frustration and why they went to President O'Connell's office. I was supportive of their, their boycott and I was, was not supportive of them being arrested, uh, which they were, which caused a lot of problems later on since most of the African-American students withdrew from campus as a result of that incident and the lack of support for an Office of Minority Affairs and, and an accurate an adequate support for increasing minority representation on campus. Okay, um, so do you, uh, was that one of the reasons I, I heard, I read online that you also asked for O'Connell's, President O'Connell's resignation, was that sort of um, a motivation for that as well? Well, I, I, I had a rocky relationship with President O'Connell, even though later in life we did become friends. Uh, I thought that he, he shouldn't have had, had the students arrested. He should have had more patience with those students. I th thought it set a bad precedent. Uh, I thought that he could have met with them even though they didn't have an appointment. Uh, and I think that it, it, as a result of, of all that, the, uh, they get, received a lot of state and national press I remember talking with Jim Wooten of the New York Times who did a front page story about what was happening at the University of Florida at the time. And uh, I, I, I felt like in light of the circumstances that he should consider resignation. Uh, there were other incidents in, throughout the year that I was student by presidents where we disagreed. I respected the man as an individual 
but I disagreed with his policy as president at the time. As I said, later in life, we became friends. Mm -hmm. um, and kind of going back to student government, um, I see that you, you mentioned that you were very supportive of the kind of um, issues that the African-American students brought up and you were supportive of the BSU. Was there a lot of conversations about this issue, not just concerning Black Thursday, but of the lack of representation among minorities in student government, or was this not kind of addressed at all? Well, I tried to have a fair representation of African-American students in my administration. I created an office of minority affairs, and uh, I tried to emphasize the importance of increasing integration of our campus and more recognition of faculty that were, were, were African-Americans. Uh, I thought an office of minority affairs was necessary, which later was created, even though at the time it wasn't, a, 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 wasn't something that the president approved. Uh, the, during the time I was student body president, I, I always thought that there were two issues that, so were, that I felt like were the most important reasons to to accomplish uh, my goals were, were both the, the uh, opposition to, I'm sorry, this keeps going off on my computer. When I get no, it's okay. <laughs> it's part of modern technology. But uh, I, I, I felt like that the opposition to the Vietnam War and the, the civil rights movement were the two most important things in my administration. Uh, I felt like there was a lot of support for people that, that thought the war was wrong, especially after Kent State, where mm -hmm. the students were killed and we had a protest at uh, Plaza of the Americas where over 3,000 students showed up. And later that I called for a day of mourning to call the, to call the attention to what happened in Kent State as a result of the killings. It was because of, it was doing a protest where students were protesting at Kent State, and the National Guard fired shots and killed four students, and that set off a national spark of energy against the war that was already brewing. Uh, but I called for a day of mourning, and the president didn't agree, but later he did agree, and that we had a day where nobody showed up to classes, on, and to show our support for the students that have been killed in their opposition to the war. Mm -hmm. that's, that's really interesting. <laughs> um, often on campus, currently we don't have that many protests. I feel like when we look back at previous years, it was a lot more um, geared towards student involvement and it's interesting to hear about that. Um, I did, um, there is this other interview that we went over in class that was with one of the members of the BSU and he mentioned that the BSU was kind of organized similarly um, to the Black Panthers in a sense and I wanted to know if this kind of organization had any effect on sentiments of probably like white students on campus towards the BSU or was there um, nothing, like no conflict? on campus at the time? Uh, I didn't think of them as Black Panthers. I thought of them as of activists. I thought Black Panthers was a much more radical group than the Black Student Union was. So I would disagree with that statement. And uh, I think that the Black Student Union played a, a very important role. The president of Black Student Union, Mitch Dasher, was a very close friend of mine. I was able successfully to get him in as the first Black member of Blue Key, uh, which we, emphasized that we, we wanted that to happen. It was a group of us that said there's going to be an African-American in, initiated and we were going to hold out everybody until the, until uh, an African-American got in Blue Key, which we did get okay. them in. Okay. Um, you kind of mentioned that because of the, um, the arrest that O'Connell kind of called on the students during Black Thursday. There was a lot of national attention. Um, and this was, this was kind of like a negative, um, I, I, yeah. <laughs> this block, kind block. of, yeah, just like blocking, negative kind of um, perception of UF uh, at the time. 
it, was that is that true? Was there a lot of like negative sentiments towards you because of what had occurred? There was a mixed sentiment. There were there were people who felt that black students went too far and O'Connell was right. There were those that thought that O'Connell went too far in having him arrested. And there were those that were ambivalent. Uh, but I think mostly, I would say because of the politics of Florida at the time that probably most people were probably against students protesting in the president's office. But mm -hmm. as we learn later in life, those that are offering the minority often become the majority later. And I think the opinion swung in that we did realize there was a need for dramatic improvement in, in African-American enrollment at the University of Florida. And as a result of those students withdrawing from campus, I think there were 250. I remember the coach Dickey trying to get some of his athletes out of the line that were in the line to withdraw from campus. Yeah, but there was a very strong feeling that some of those students did it out of absolute 100% belief they were right. And I think most of them were right. I don't think they were right to resign from school. I think that hurt them academically, but they were willing to pay the price to show importance of their stand on, on, on increased integration into schools. But uh, it, it, was, it was a difficult period, tremendous stress between students and, 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 and administration. I think most faculty supported the position of the students. Uh, and uh, I think the I think the fact that I had a lot of support from the students, the African American students, and the students generally, that I think we were able to accomplish a lot during that those years that year. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, so let's see conversations in SG. Do you think um, at the time one of the only I think uh, newspapers that reported on UF and student government business was the Alligator, and then later on the Iguana appeared. Do you think the Alligator had kind of um, a bias towards how things were reported back then, or do you think they stayed true to events and how they occurred? I think they stayed true to the events. I think their opinion page was very pro student, uh, very supportive of African-American students, very supportive of activism on the campus against the war. So I think overall the Alligator was very fair, but it was a first rate paper then, and I, it was later thrown off campus by O'Connell uh, and became an independent friend of mine who was the editor of the paper at the time, uh, got arrested, I don't know if you know about that, for publishing abortion information. Uh, and uh, O'Connell, as a result of that, made the Alligator uh, an independent paper that was published off campus. The, uh, mm -hmm. the editor published a phone number for an abortion clinic. And it was illegal at the time. It was before Roe versus Wade. And mm -hmm. so it was very controversial. And the students generally supported the Alligator and what they had done. Okay, I, I did not know about that. That's actually really interesting. Um, let me think. <laughs> uh, so you mentioned a lot of things that kind of give us a different insight into what occurred at the time. You mentioned when we first started talking that Black Thursday occurred towards the end of your term as student body president. Is that correct? At what? At the towards the end of your term as student body president. That's when it's approximately when the, the, the Black Thursday happened. Mm -hmm. Do you think the handoff of from you to Don Middlebrook uh, kind of helped with the issues that they were trying to uh, that they were concerned with, with like inclusion and like more right. Black faculty? Do you think that was achieved um, even though you stopped being the president at the time? Yeah, I think that Don was my closest friend and. Uh, it was great that he was elected. He ran on a platform that was progressive and also carrying out a lot of the programs we had implemented. So I was pleased that he got elected. We still remain very close friends and keep in contact regularly. So we've been friends for 50 plus some years as a result of our relationship, both in student government and fraternities and, and other activities. Okay, thank you for that. Let me see my other questions. 
um, let's say. So do you think you're, um, I saw that you uh, studied law, right? You're a lawyer, you have your own law firm. Um, do you think your involvement in student government kind of was a result of you studying law or it also helped you in your career later on in life? Yeah, I think going to University of Florida, going to law school and being student by president had the biggest impact in my life as anything. Uh, I met governor, then candidate Senator Askew, who was running for governor when he was, when I was student body president. We put together a student group of president of the IFC, president of student body, president of Blue Key to support his candidacy for governor. And it later, and a couple of years later, he offered me a job to work in his administration that I wouldn't, that's how I ended up in Tallahassee because I had met him at the University of Florida while I was student body president. He later offered me a job. I became general counsel of his community affairs department. Uh, later became counsel in his office. During that same time period, I, I became executive director of the Constitutional Revision Commission while he was governor. So all those jobs and the opportunities I had working for him influenced my life uh, tremendously. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, let's see. So involvement. Um, okay. So given your past position and your involvement in student government in the past, uh, what would be some recommendations that you would give to those in student government currently um, that have experienced student unrest given some unfair treatment of students or just unfair policies at the University of Florida? Well, I think the primary goal of student government is to be a voice for the students on campus. You can't represent everybody, but you need to represent as many of the people that in diverse views as you can. I believe the, the student government has, has played a very important role throughout the University of Florida's history. Uh, ironically, when I was student body president, I thought the Board of Regents, which controlled the university system, was arbitrary in a lot of its decisions and I had called for the abolition of the Board of Regents. Ironically, in 1997, many years later, I became chair of the Board of Regents. <laughs> and what were your motivations be uh, behind um, asking for the uh, abolition of the Board of Regents? Well, they were, they were criticized, and one of the regents criticized the, the college dormitories as, as a, as houses of ill repute and uh, said there was too much activity between men and women, boys and girls on in the dormitory and they wanted to more closely regulate activities in the dormitory. There was also efforts to raise, uh, to allow, the, to allow the, the university to start charging students to go to football games. When, when we started, you just had to show your ID and you showed up and when it felt like you, you, you were paying to go to school, it should be going to athletic events should be a part of uh, of the the activities you could go to for free. So when mm -hmm. when they had the orange and blue game and and uh, I think it was April that year, right around the same time as the Black Thursday, we organized a protest to get the students to leave the orange and blue game in protest of the students being charged to go to the game. To go to football games and uh, and also some of the other athletic policies of, of Coach Dickey, who I didn't find very supportive of student athletes. Uh, we were able to get 5,000 students to leave the game and uh, go to across the street in the, in the parking lot and have a, a concert uh, in support. And uh, I remember the cheerleaders wouldn't give me their. Uh, their microphone to ask the students to leave. So I, I, in an arbitrary move, got the students started to cut out the funding, which was not very kind. But at the time, I didn't think not allowing me to use their microphone, which we were, student government was funding, shouldn't uh, have taken place. So we cut out their funding, which they later got back. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's funny. Um, okay, so a couple of things that you mentioned. Uh, let's start with, you kind of mentioned Coach Dickey during um, Black Thursday as well. He didn't want his students to get, he kind of like tried to get his students to not withdraw from the university. Um, and he was also not 
too supportive of uh, what student athletes, I think you mentioned. Um, could there, was you kind union, of there was a student union that a number of athletes were trying to start, including Carlos Alvarez and a track star named John Parker. Carlos later was a all American football player that thought that that the university wasn't doing enough to support its student athletes. And he wanted to form a student union and a Dickey opposed it as did the administration. And even though he was an all American, uh, the best player on the team coach because he, 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 because he organized protest against the athletic department and the creation of a student union, he was benched uh, for a part of a couple of games. But he later became a very successful lawyer, a very close friend. He lives in Tallahassee and still outspoken in support of minority causes. Okay. Thank you, thank you for elaborating on that. I didn't know how to ask. Um, so you were a part of the Board of Regents, ironically, even though you asked for the abolition of the board. Um, what were some things that were discussed while you were, if you are allowed to talk about uh, while you were on the board, um, which would be, could you also say like from what year to what year you were on the board? the Board of Regents from 90, 93, 1993 to 2001, when, when the Board of Regents was abolished and a new, and it was created the Board of Trustees at universities. Uh, mm -hmm. I was then, I was appointed by Governor Childs uh, to the Board of Regents, reappointed by Governor Bush to the Board of Regents when I later became chair. Uh, mm -hmm. I was later appointed, ironically, to the Board of Trustees of Florida State University when they first created the, the trustees. And then I later was appointed by Governor Bush to, to be on the Board of Governors, uh, the original Board of Governors that controls the university system now. So I had, mm -hmm. I'm probably the only person that served as a Board of Regents chair served as a trustee of a university and also served on the Board of Governors. Okay, and um, are you allowed to talk about what went on while you were there? No, a lot went on. I, I, I called for, I, I, I thought that the tenure system was adequate, ad, antiquated, and I called for a review of the tenure system in, in our universities to require professors to be periodically reevaluated you know, not necessarily have their tenure taken away, but to have improvement opportunities for faculty. And if they didn't, they, they, they could jeopardize their tenure. I felt like that. I also supported uh, public evaluation, the, the leasing the valuations of students, of professors. They were private records when I came in as a member of the Board of Regents and I changed that policy so that students would have access to the to the previous student's opinion on, on faculty. I was also a supporter of a great increase in faculty salaries, even though I was in favor of, of some kind of review of the tenure system. I also felt many of the faculty were very underpaid and should be paid more, so I worked on that. I, I worked on creating uh, opportunities for community service. At every one of my meetings as chair of the Board of Regents, I recognized on that campus where we were meeting an outstanding community service volunteer that was a student, a faculty member, and an administrator. So I wanted to emphasize the importance of, of, of uh, community service as part of your education. I, I also uh, was, was, I was very, when I was chair of the Board of Regents, I had a very controversial period with the president of the University of Florida, John Lombardi. He had, uh, I got a call one day uh, shortly after Christmas from, from a, a spouse of a vice president saying that she was at a Christmas party uh, at the president's mansion where he called the new chancellor who was African-American in Oreo. And uh, I found out about oh, yeah. it and asked for him to apologize. He didn't apologize, so I asked for him to, to resign. So I didn't, I didn't we went for a week of back and forth with the president about his comment. He eventually apologized. The chancellor, the new chancellor, who was a, who was a former president of the University of North Florida, an outstanding uh, chancellor, uh, Adam Herbert, uh, accepted his apology and we moved on. But during that time period, there was a lot of calls for my resignation for trying to fire the president, but I felt what he said was wrong and that it, 
in fact, my law firm, I was in a big law firm at the time, Holland and Height, uh, which is probably the largest firm in Florida now. Uh, and they had business taken away from them by the city of Gainesville because I, because I tried to fire the president of the University of Florida. I, there was a lot of, they created an organization where they, they, the, the boosters called the governor's office asking for my resignation over that, which the governor supported me. So did the governor, uh, G Governor Bush, who was running for election, also supported my position, but it was a very unpopular position at the time with a lot of people on campus. John Lombardi was a very talented individual, but he, his mouth often got ahead of his head. And I think in that case, he, he learned the lesson and he apologized and we moved on. He later made some other mistakes. He got him in a situation where he lost his job, moved on, but that was not, not part of anything I had anything to do with. Mm -hmm. Okay. That, that's that's really interesting and I really like where this conversation is going. <laughs> um, so kind of going back, um, instead of kind of after graduating from UF, I kind of want to go back to um, your life as a student at UF. Um, did you, pr prior to um, being involved in student government, what were your days like? Like, were you involved in anything else? Was, or yeah, Right. I was president of my fraternity. I was a tap. I was. We were the first fraternity to take an African American in. Uh, in our in a, in a fraternity it was 1966. We we and I was I was a member of the fraternity at the time. I was proud that we did that. Uh, I was also very involved in, in a fraternity council. I was treasurer of the inner fraternity council, so I had made a lot of friends in the other fraternities, and that's. Partially how I built my coalition to run for president was I had a lot of support from fraternities and sororities. I was sort of the blue key fraternity anti-establishment candidate. That's, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I was able to get the establishment to support me even though I was taking views such as some of the ads I ran were, you know, we had first, we had first rate athletics and sometimes second rate academics. That we, that, that we should put academics ahead of athletics and we, our, 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 our reputation should be based not just on athletics, but solely on what we did as an academic institution and what we stood for both racially and, and through diversity. And then I thought that the University of Florida was, was not doing enough to, to raise its standards to, to make it the outstanding university it became. It was the best university. It had always been the best university in Florida, but I thought it could be better. And I thought that we could push harder for improvements in, 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 in the academic programs and opportunities for, for more students. Okay. Um, so kind of um, the platform that you ran on was very like anti-establishment and you had a bunch of policies that you wanted to change. Um, aside from kind of uh, achieving more African-American um, inclusion, what were some other things that you were able to achieve while you were student body president? We, can, we, can, we can, uh, created an office of consumer affairs in which we were able to help students find the best prices on goods. We tried to buy things and get people to buy, government to buy things in bulk that we could sell. We tried to have more, more uh, speakers come to campus. We had the accent program that was started uh, around my, my, around the time I was president, uh, which brought a lot of people to campus, a lot of significant, well-known people that uh, made a difference. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, they were also gonna build the O'Connell Center, which now the O'Connell Center on Lake Alice, near Lake Alice, we stopped that. We had a, we, forced a referendum to stop the building of, of, a, of, a, of a coliseum near Lake Alice, which would have been environmentally not sensitive. But we also didn't think it, that the students' tuition should be raised to pay for the, to pay for the, 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 the arena. So we, we were able to stop initially the building of the, the coliseum, which later was built in the, in the proper place across from the 
athletic field and was not funded with student dollars, but general revenue dollars. So we accomplished that. We also uh, we also uh, had oh, I, I went to, while I was while I was president I went to every dormitory I was in a dormitory every every most every night of the week uh, meeting with students or a fraternity house dormitory I was a great believer and you needed to connect with the students that you were representing and the only way I could represent them was to listen to what they had to say. Okay, that's um, that's I I really like that all of this kind of occurred during your um, what what is it term as president? I um at the time when the accent uh, when accent was um kind of started during your uh, it, was, it was started the year it, it was we we it was started I believe the year before. Um, but we, okay. we were able to increase the funding for it. I, I didn't start the program. Right, right, right. But it was like around that time and you were, you, you, you like came in and you already had it. Um, while, um, uh, I'm trying to figure out. So at the time while you were there or maybe like before, if you could help me out like to know about this, was Accent, um, were the speakers paid with student fees? Yes. Um, to bring them on campus? Yes. Okay. Uh, do you think that that is like, that that's fine? Yeah, we had diverse, even though I, I would consider myself a progressive, we had invited people like Strom Thurmond, who, who spoke on campus, who was probably mm -hmm. one of the most conservative members of the US Senate. We also had Jane Fonda. Jane Fonda, I, I remember picking her up at the airport and trying to carry her bag, and she wouldn't let me carry her bag. She wanted to carry it herself. And mm -hmm. we had a we I had her speak in the at, at, in the Graham Pond area, Graham you mm -hmm. know the Graham dormitories. We had like ten thousand students show up to hear her speak uh, in the in, oh, the, wow. in the in the Graham area. The whole area was just flooded with students. Uh, we, we had student we had speakers like Julian Bond. He was a civil rights activist in, in, from Atlanta who who later became a, a national figure. He came to uh, speak. We had Melvin Belli, an outstanding lawyers. We had Justice Douglas, who was on the Supreme Court. We took, we brought him to campus. I remember spending the day with him and Don Motorbooks, driving him back to to Jacksonville, where we take him to the airport uh, with my constitutional law book, asking him questions about cases he had decided. So I remember that very well. That day, it was a very significant day. But I, I as, as a result of, I got involved a lot in, in politics as a result of my interest in politics at the University of Florida. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things I, I met uh, shortly after I left the university, I, I ran South Florida candidate, candidacy for Ed Muskie for president, who, who didn't win. But it was, I thought, the stronger candidate between George McGovern and Ed Muskie. I, I always believe if you're going to get your policies through, you've got to get somebody that can get elected. And if you can't get them elected, you're not going to get the policies you want. So I, Muskie was more moderate and thought I had a better chance to beat Nixon. So I supported him when he ran for president and ran his South Florida operation. Okay, um, let's see, I should be kind of addressed. So kind of going back to accent, I know that a lot of, um, the whole purpose of accent is to bring people of different ideologies or perspectives to the University of Florida kind of to give us a, a lot of things to like a lot of different ideas to absorb um, and I really enjoy accent but do you um, I'm sure that you heard about the issue uh, with uh, uh, Donald Trump, Trump Jr's yeah. yeah Trump's son coming to campus how do you how do you feel about that I have mixed feelings about it I, I it, it, it it was viewed as a campaign event on their part and, a, and, a, and an academic event on the university's part. Am I correct? I mean, yes. I thought it shouldn't have been a campaign event, but end of the day, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't think it was, was that big a deal. Mm -hmm. Oh, so um, okay. <laughs> so I think, um, he, should, I think he shouldn't have charged anything. I think he should have come and not charged anything. I think it's ridiculous. That, 
fee got paid, but I had no problem with them coming. Right. I think that was the main issue that a lot of students had was the amount of money that was um, given that we all know that accent is taken out of student fees, the amount of money that was used towards bringing them on campus for basically a campaign ad. I think right. that was the main reason why people were so upset. Right. Yeah. I agree. Um, mm -hmm. uh, let's see. So uh, real quick, Consumers Affairs Office. Um, where did that, where did the motivation for that? That comes from I just thought if we bought things in bulk, you know, we could save students money and uh, we supported a, a used used bookstore. We we took on, you know, trying to organize used books that outside the bookstore in order to reduce the cost of the books. We we try to have information about merchants on in the community that were giving student discounts, trying to get student discounts. Mm -hmm. One of the other issues I remember uh, around that time was that uh, it wasn't easy for students to register to vote in, in, in Gainesville because they came from different locations and the supervisor of elections uh, in, in, in Gainesville what wasn't allowing students to register to vote in Gainesville. So the governor at that time, Governor Kirk heard about it, called me. I told him what the problem was. He called the supervisor of elections and they started letting students to register. So we made a, we accomplished, that was another major accomplishment, getting students to register to vote. Even though a lot of them didn't register, we at least had the opportunity to, to do so. Uh, so why, why were students not allowed to vote? Or not because allowed they to were saying they, if they came from West Palm Beach, their family lived in West Palm Beach. They said they should be able to, they should vote in West Palm Beach, not in Gainesville. Gainesville was in their permanent residence. It was their right. permanent residence at the time, but in strict terms, it came from someplace else. Right. Mm, that is kind of an issue currently, I guess. But usually, um, I, I don't vote for like local elections just because like, as you said, like I'm not gonna be here for that long and it doesn't really affect me as a citizen. So I, I get it, <laughs> but um, that's that's interesting. Uh, were they just barred completely from voting in? in no, no, they did make it very difficult. It was very difficult to register. Okay, okay. And, and the governor um, helped me take care of that. Right, right. Who's calling me? Oh. Okay. Um, wait. <laughs> my my computer is freaking out right now. Um, so kind of like, I really, I'm really confused about that actually. So were, what kind of measures were taken to, um, prevent pe uh, students from registering? Well, they, they just, just made it like, really from, They would ask where you're from and you're not from Gainesville. They would make it hard. Do you plan to stay in Gainesville after you, read, after you graduate? You know, things like that. Mm -hmm. People don't know where they're going to be after they graduate. Right. Yeah. You don't really look that far into the future. Um, so wait, let's see. Um, I wrote a lot on here. So, okay. So maybe going back to um, your presence on the Board of Regents slash Board of Trustees um, and your kind of the work that you did there, do you, did you resign or, uh, how how did that work? Like when you finished working there, I mean, resigned from where? From the board of trustees or the board of regents or how did I never, that work? I never resigned. I, I just oh, okay. I, I just the board of regents was was uh, uh, taken out by the legislature, and then they created mm -hmm. trustees, and then I went on the trustees, and then later uh, Senator Graham. I got a constitutional moment passed to have Board of Governors and Trustees. So I served in the Board of Governors then too. Uh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. And after I, after, I after I served on the Board of Governors, I served as chair of the Fulbright Scholarship Board. I was appointed by President Bush to serve as chair. So for four years, I was chair of the Fulbright Scholarship Board and got to travel around the world meeting outstanding students. Uh, this was part of my continuing interest in higher education. 
Um, so, hmm. Um, do you think the presence of fraternities in student government, I don't know how it was back then, but was it a lot bigger than just normal students that weren't in the Pan-Atlantic Council or in the like multicultural right. council? Do you think- Right, fraternities were very active in, in student government. I guess they were then and they are now, I, I mm -hmm. understand. And you know, there's an, you set up to get involved, it gives you an opportunity to get in Blue Key, and then you get in Blue Key, you get an opportunity to get more of your fraternity brothers in the Blue Key. And it's just, but I think it, it, it should be, Blue Key should, at the time should be balanced. We should have an equal number of fraternity and non fraternity members in Blue Key. Uh, I, I thought the criteria for Blue Key was often slanted more towards whether you had fraternity support or you didn't, which I, we tried to make it more make it more fair for whether you were an attorney or not i know they didn't want to make one of the issues we added was was being president of life student union a, a significant enough position or a major to get you in blue key and, and they were, there were those that argued well they, was, they never got in blue key before well first of all they've never been a black student union. so so we fought hard to get the president of black student union Okay, um, so I, I'm really bad at dates, but um, I know that the reason for uh, the demands that were given during Black Thursday were um, like some of the ones that you mentioned, the lack of uh, diversity and inclusion, and there was no African American studies program. But um, I believe the IBC was made shortly after, if I'm not um, mistaken, is that true? What was the night story? Uh, the Institute of Black Culture, the IBC. Yeah, it was. It came on after that. Yes. Mm -hmm. And you were not president at that time. It was Don Middlebrook. Yes. Were you still at the university when that occurred? I, um, I, I was in university till the end of '71. I taught. I, I while I was studying for the bar, I taught at business law at business school. So I was there for a half a year after I was president. Until I, I graduated and then went on and taught for six for one semester. Mm -hmm. And um, kind of concerning the IBC, although you're not a part, or maybe you were of campus and you weren't in student government, um, what could you say um, about the sentiments towards the creation of the IBC, if you know about anything concerning that? No, I thought it was a good idea and was important. Mm -hmm. But um, as you as yourself, obviously, you support it. But do you think anyone on campus was kind of against it? There were some against it. There were a lot of conservatives that were against it. But I think it overall it was supportive. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's just hard to believe there were so few black faculty and few black students on this campus. I mean, I, I think they were like 30, I, I don't, I'm recalling from the past, maybe 350 students and 25 faculty members. Mm -hmm. But, uh, and, and it wasn't until around that time that first black athletes started attending Florida as well. I mean, mm -hmm. that made a big difference as well. Um, let's see. I don't know if I asked you this. Do you think you were able to meet what the, um, the policies that you ran on while you were president? Do you think you met all of the ones that you wanted to, or were you, um, or were there things that you wanted to change that you were not able to? There were things I wasn't able to change that, uh, I think we did an awful lot. The, uh, but I think in a, a year we accomplished quite a bit and we, we changed the direction of student government from being a, just a fraternity run, blue key run organization to one that was more inclusive. 
Okay, and we're almost done. We have like 15 minutes left. But um, I just wanted to know, this is more like for, pers for personal reasons because um, before the quarantine, my project was going to be on uh, white supremacy on campus or in Gainesville. And I wanted to know if you were made aware of any kind of uh, racist sentiment towards black students on campus or just in Gainesville in general, or if you had no idea of things happening. You're talking about today? No, just like at the time or even in the 90s, I do remember that there was the white student union made. Although you weren't on campus, you might have been aware of it. I'm not sure. Just like asking your opinion. No, I really, uh, there, was, there, there was prejudice in all corners of society. Uh, it took a long time for civil rights. We still have, don't have total civil rights in this country. Uh, which minorities are still have a much rougher time getting ahead than do non-minorities. Uh, I think what we went through in the late 60s, 70s, was a transformation for people that didn't understand the plight or didn't want to know the plight of the African American and American society. And we made strides both as a state, university, and a nation to, to improve, improve ourselves, be better, be a better place to be. Um. Ooh, I, I don't know what else to ask you. <laughs> I've asked you all my questions. Um, is there anything else that you would like to mention given the context of the interview? It's a Samuel Proctor history interview, right? He was, mm -hmm. he, he, would, he was the, I knew him quite well. He, well, he had been the uh, faculty advisor to our fraternity, the Tep House. And later, Dr. Goffman, who was a close friend of mine, who's an economics professor, took his place. He was a very outstanding economics professor. So actually, I got to know Dr. Proctor during the time I was a member of the Tep House and also president. He was very helpful and very good man and excellent professor. It's great this history series is named after him. Yeah, and it's very helpful to see um, not just sentiments on campus, but just people's stories and how they are contextualized in life at, in Gainesville and at UF. So um, this, has, this has been like very helpful. Thank you so much for being here, for, for letting me interview you. Um, it has been very informative. Thank you so much. Well, I'm glad I did. Let, let, you know, University of Florida gave me a lot of opportunities I wouldn't otherwise have. I was the first one in my family to get a college degree. Uh, and uh, I came from a background where, where, where my, most of my family were killed in the Holocaust. So I always had a close place in my heart for people that were discriminated against. Uh, and it still do, always have, always will. Uh, I believe it's always important to stand up for what you believe in, no matter the consequences. And there were consequences uh, that I faced uh, when I, when I, even though I had been president of the student body and I had, was a decent student, it wasn't easy for me initially to get a, a job in a law firm because of my actions at the University of Florida against the president. But I later, uh, it, 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 interesting story, uh, my first law firm I was at, the Osley Law Firm in Tallahassee, uh, I, I went there after I was executive director of the Constitutional Revision Commission, but I had been offered a job by Holland and Knight. And one of the members of Holland and Knight was close to, to President O'Connell and felt like after I shouldn't, after I had been given an offer, I was, re, was retracted uh, because was, was his former chair of the Board of Regents was very outspoken against me being a member of that, that uh, law firm. And uh, I went on, joined another law firm, the Osley firm, which was a great firm. And six months after that, this, this gentleman, Burke Kibler, who was chairman of the Board of Regents, uh, came, who had been chairman of the Board of Regents, came and apologized to me for what he had done. Mm -hmm. He later became, I later became a managing partner in Tallahassee office, Holland and I, in that same person that 
wanted to keep me out of the firm, became one of my closest friends. Wow, there, there's a lot of um, different kind of stories weaving in there. It's really interesting to hear. Um, but um, like I mentioned, thank you so much. This has been really um, informative, very enjoyable to talk to you. Um, I hope that given the situation, you stay safe, you stay healthy, um, and that this kind of blows over soon. <laughs> Hopefully it will. But, um, How are students yeah, dealing with I, it? The, the dealing, is it difficult? It is kind of hard. Um, honestly, my grades have become better <laughs> because I have nothing to distract me from school because I'm at school all day. But um, I do have a job <laughs> that I um, uh, got and it might be postponed uh, because of the virus. It's, it's a teaching job abroad, um, which I also had applied to Fulbright, but I did not get it, unfortunately. I'm sorry. It's hard. It's, it's totally very hard. hard. It's very. Where did you apply? Which country? Uh, South Korea. Did you speak South Korean? Korea. I speak Korean. Yes. Well, it, it would have been a good. I went to South Korea while uh, during my time in, uh, on the in the Fulbright board, but uh, mm -hmm. I learned a lot from the Fulbright board. I learned a lot from the students I met. It was a great program. And, uh, yeah, I was kind of looking forward to it, but then um, we, the, where I work is a teaching uh, school, the English Language Institute at UF, and um, we had someone that is part of the UF kind of coordinators for Fulbright come in, and she was saying that only one person that had not applied through UF, which was me, had become a semi finalist, and I was like, oh, there I am, haha. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, uh, it's totally fine. I got the other job, so it's it's the same. It's, it's it's ironic that my my grandson, my oldest grandson, is a senior in high school, and he's he's number one in his class, and he's looking at Florida and Florida State and several other places, and and uh, I hope he considers Florida. It's a serious. He's, his mother went to Florida State, so she's prejudiced. But I hope that uh, that he, that other students like him get to go to chance to the University of Florida. University of Florida made all the difference in my life. I met met my wife there, met my best friends there, attorney brothers, members of the student government. People, I, like today, I talked to a attorney brother about a legal issue. I have about I'd say twenty close friends and. I'd say 15 of them are met at University of Florida. So it made a big difference. And I encourage students that you go there to get involved, stay active, speak your mind, learn, listen, take action. Oh, <laughs> I should have wrote that down. <laughs> okay. Um, oh, I have like another meeting like in a couple of minutes. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Yeah. But um, yeah, uh, school has been hard, but it's we're getting through it. It's totally fine. Um, I'm, I'm, uh, what is it? Lucky. <laughs> I'm lucky that this is my last semester, so it's totally fine. But, um, but like I said, uh, thank you so much, Steve, for talking with me. Sure. Um, uh, I. Uh, how do you all, I, do you I, all I, show I, these histories in class, or, or do you? Do yeah. So what we do is um, I'm recording currently and that'll go up to the cloud and I'll send it to the person that's in charge of organizing the audio files. And then I think I am the one that has to write out a transcript because we always have a transcript just in case. Um, and we usually go over them in class or we have them kind of as a homework and we listen to them, we discuss what we think about the audio Usually, um, the audio gives us an insight into like life at UF, how this person went through school at UF, what occurred, stuff like that. And uh, you, we, so for this, I had to choose someone to talk to, and I was going, I was going to interview two people, that, but then one of them already got interviewed, so I ended up interviewing you. But I wanted um, a perspective on 
like a a non African American perspective on life at UF, given uh, and also like your position in student government is very interesting. Even like it was at the time of Black Thursday, so it would be interesting to hear um, your opinion on the situation, because we only ever hear from um, the BSO former BSU members and people that were there at the time, um, and there were no records of anyone talking with you. But um, that that was the reason why I wanted to speak with you on the subject. That's great, and uh, I enjoyed it. And uh, I, uh, the Black Student Union had a reunion, I think, 20 years ago, where they brought together a lot of the students that left the school, and they invited me to come and recognize me, which was nice. Mm -hmm. So um, it was a big day in my life that Thursday and a big impact on the university and I think we made a difference. And uh, I think those students had the courage to resign, sent a strong message to why we needed to change what the policies of the University of Florida. And uh, because the University of Florida has, has a history of Virgil Hawkins, that it's a whole different issue at the law school. But mm -hmm. uh, yeah. because of the history, it was really important. We make things better. So can, can you send me a copy of this? Yeah, of course. Um, when I get the file, I'll email it to you. Okay. okay. It was a, a pleasure and uh, good luck in your future and uh, thank you for taking the time to talk with me. Yeah, thank you for taking the time to talk with me. Okay, we're happy. Okay. You too. Goodbye. Stay safe. Stay safe. Mm -hmm. I will. <laughs> we, we should take. We should take. You should take the history ones, to, the, the oral histories you're doing during the quarantine, and put them in a separate section. <laughs> Six feet that apart. would be a lot more interesting. Six yeah. Feet apart. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, great. Thank you, goodbye. Steve. Goodbye.